I love libraries. I work with libraries all the time. I believe libraries do have a future, but I'm very aware, uh, certainly this is true in England, and I think true in Sweden as well, libraries are coming under more pressure than ever before. Some of the pressures we have, financial, uh, in England we have big cuts at the moment, and yet at the same time, the library is expected to do more. <laughs> Less money, more work. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yes, you recognise it. <clears throat> Politically, uh, everybody thinks libraries are a good thing, but we have to justify ourselves more than we used to. We have to prove our value. Culturally, um, we have people who say, well, why do you need libraries now? You have Amazon and Google. I'm sure you have an answer to that, I do. Uh, but I think we need to articulate, we need to get that answer out. And the work that we do, which is all about promoting reading from the reader's point of view, I think it can help libraries in all those areas. It gives you some good arguments to make. So as well as learning practically, I hope the arguments will help too. Where I'm coming from is not just from what I think, it's also from a lot of evidence and research. And I just wanted briefly, before I get to the pretty pictures, to give you some of the background. Okay. Uh, we have a database of about 40,000, it's probably more than that now, customer interviews uh, in the UK, and we have another, ooh, I don't know how many, in Australia. Because we run an online training course for library staff, frontline library staff, and the first thing they do on the course, uh, it's a computer course online, but it's real too, so you have to go into the library, and you have to ask five people, different people, not all your friends, not all middle-aged women. If you just do five middle-aged women, you get sent back saying, where's a man? <laughs> um, and you must ask them, how did you choose the book or the DVD that you're borrowing today? Tell me how you chose one of them, okay? So we now have 40,000 people who have told us a question, you know, the answer to that question. Now, I haven't read them all. I would be lying to you if I said I'd looked at all 40,000. But I have dipped in and had a good look. And we know the same patterns come out every time. Most people in public libraries in the UK choose from displays. Whatever book you have put into a prominent position, they will take that. So you have a lot of power. And I think how we use that power is very important. We've also done a lot of, in English, the word is observation. It's watching people. This is a technique used in retail uh, research, uh, big stores and little ones too, shopping malls. Uh, they've used it for about 20 years watching what people do. It's very sophisticated now, and uh, actually the most recent versions all use um, an eye thing so you can actually track what people look at. Because I knew when you ask people what they do in a library and where they go, what they tell you is different from what they actually do. Well, when they put the eye tracker in, it is fascinating what people actually look at. Uh, for instance, everybody in supermarkets says they are influenced by price. None of them look at price at all. But they do know instinctively where certain things are. It's interesting. So we have done, probably again more than a thousand now, observations of how people use a library. When they come in, which way do they go? Uh, how many of them get to the back? How many of them go upstairs? Uh, it is fascinating information. And it may be that we can plan something that would come out of this where you do something similar. And we've also had much longer conversations with readers in setting up reading groups, which we've set up a lot of reading groups. I know you have reading... How many people here are in a reading group? A book group? Yeah, we have a few. You'll know if you do that regularly, it's such a good way to have 
understanding about books. Because you read a book, you have your opinion. And you think, everybody agrees with me. They all had the same experience as I do. You know, I turn up to, and I'm going to say, it was really boring here, and then it got really exciting. Oh! Somebody else thinks completely the opposite from you, always. And you can't predict which person it's going to be. It is such a lesson. I think it's very, very good experience for understanding how people read, what they get out of reading. So that's also where I'm coming from. So what we learn from research and observation, most people in public libraries in the UK are chance browsers. Now, I can't prove it's the same in Sweden, but I guess you're not so very different. Mm. The proportion of people who know what they want and go and find it is getting smaller every day. The majority of people come into our libraries wanting a good read. <laughs> but what does that mean? They don't have a name, an author, a title in mind. And how are we helping those people? We've also discovered that few people ask the staff anything. The staff are so friendly in libraries, we assume everybody will ask us all the time. Because we are nice, aren't we? That's why I work with libraries. And we are, you know, when people ask us things, we're, we're good at the answers. We don't make people feel stupid, which many officials do. I, I love libraries for that. If somebody has a question which is not, you know, it's hard to understand, library staff are brilliant at helping. If somebody's first language isn't the same as yours, they're good. If somebody has a disability, they're good, it's great. But the truth is, many more people are in the library not talking to you than talking to you. Okay. And the third one, again, this is well known in England now, it may not be exactly the same as Sweden, but I would be fascinated to find out, the average length of visit to a library in the UK is between five and ten minutes. Now, when I started, I assumed it would be at least 20, because this includes everybody who comes to study, and some of them are there for two hours. It includes everybody who uses a computer, and most of those are booked in one-hour slots. So we have two hours, one hour, this end, and the average is still between five and ten minutes. That means a lot of people are in for just two minutes, three minutes. Okay. How are we meeting their needs? So, <clears throat> fitting with retail research, if you want to read up some of this, this is the uh, best-known American writer in this area, he's very good and he's very easy to read and very funny. And he shows when we go shopping, three out of four shoppers buy on impulse. It's fascinating. Uh, I won't go into the details. Oh, and this one, I will just tell you this one too. The way that people choose, this is a great book by Sheena Iyengar, another American, uh, called The Art of Choosing. She's the woman who did the famous, it was called the Jam Experiment, and she went to uh, a big department store in New York, and she had a little stand, and the first day she had three jams that you could taste and buy one of them if you liked them. The second day, she had, I think it was something like 30 jams, okay? And you could try them all and buy one if you wanted. Which day did people buy more? The one with three. Not just a little more, <laughs> ten times more. So if you give people too much choice, they can't, they're paralysed. They can't deal with it. So understanding the psychology of reading and how people choose books, one of the things we need to understand is how difficult it is to choose a book in a library. Okay. Particularly if you haven't got a name in mind. Uh, you know, we've tracked people going in and having a quick look, coming out again, not taking anything. And I think that's a bit like the jams. Three jams, oh yes, I'll try that. 30 jams, oh, it's going to take too long. 
I won't bother. And anyway, I'll have that one. And then really, that one could have been better. So how can I buy that one? Because I haven't tested them all. This is human nature, yeah? <laughs> okay. So this is the background to what I'm going to talk about, which we call the reader-centred approach to promoting books and reading. And we start with readers rather than writers. We look at why and how and where people read, how reading fits in your life. Because if you want to promote reading and books, you've got to get inside people's heads and make that connection. Uh, the word in English we use a lot now, it's very fashionable, very trendy, is engagement. Lots of people don't know what, even what it means, but they all use it. And for me, I think of, um, if you think of two pieces of machinery, two little uh, cogs in a machine, you know, the bits with the grooves that need to fit together like that, yeah? And they can just fit like that, or they can actually engage the, 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 the two pieces, and then the motor starts. That's what motors off then, okay? We're trying to get that, not just touching. <laughs> That's, you know, we need that next stage. And there's a good phrase for this in advertising, which you may have heard too. Uh, in English, it's sell the sizzle, not the sausage. The sizzle, imagine the sound of sausages frying in a pan. And it makes that sound as they're cooking, yeah? The sizzle is, is, is that noise, okay? So if I give you an example from sausages, um, <laughs> if we think of an advert for sausages on television, okay? Um, and I'm going to describe a very famous one that we had in England. Um, they always say, don't ask what's inside sausages, yeah? So if you're going to sell people sausages, you don't tell them what's in it. You don't have a big picture of a giant sausage looking very greasy. The meat content, the fat content, the content of all the other things you don't want to know about. <laughs> uh, what you do is you conjure up the experience of what sausages mean in somebody's life. Okay, So sausages in England are comfort food, home food. They're not particularly gourmet. They're something ordinary. So to sell sausages, what you do is you conjure up a picture of maybe it's um, about four o'clock in the afternoon, five o'clock. The family is coming home from work. The children coming home from school. It's getting dark. Maybe it's raining. It is England. And here is this lovely warm house glowing. And as you get closer, the door opens and you can hear the sound of the sausages cooking. And then you get a visual of the sausages, you get a visual of the kitchen, of all the people in it, the experience that they're having, okay? So that when you stand in the supermarket, in front of the freezer, and there's this little packet of grey, nondescript, in a plastic coating, or in England it's probably bright pink because they put colouring in as well, okay? They don't want you to think, what's that? They want you to think, if I buy that, okay, I'm buying that experience. I get that warmth. I get that comfort. I get that feeling at the end of the day of everything being right. I get that beautiful kitchen, which is so much nicer than mine. I get those kids who behave so much better than mine do. I get all of that if I buy this one pack of sausages. And that's how advertising works. And we think we are immune to it, but actually it's working on us subtly all the time. Okay. Now, if you tried to sell people the sausage, they wouldn't buy it. You have to sell them the experience of what the sausage can mean to them. Okay? It's just the same with books. When I first began this work with libraries, I remember sitting with librarians discussing which books would go into a promotion. Which ones were going to be in this, given this special treatment or turned face forward or put on a stand? And librarians could discuss for three months which books, that one or that one, that's the sausages, okay? I don't mind which sausages you have, but if you've not got the sizzle, nobody will pick up the sausages that you put out there. You need to get the connection, the motivation, not just the inside meat, okay? And when you describe a book to encourage others to read it, 
you need to describe its sizzle, not just its contents. Okay. This is the kind of change that we're trying to make. This is a very traditional library, standard library. Um, I'm sure you've got similar ones. And what it says to me is that we are controlling the experience on offer here. Uh, you can have it, but it must have a green dot on it first. Or a blue dot, as long as, ooh, I can't have a book in this library without a dot on. Ooh, don't escape. <laughs> yep, you recognise some of this, I'm sure. What are we selling? Green dots, blue dots, red dots. What do you like to read? Oh, red dots. That's what I love. I've always been a red dot reader. It is bonkers. It has no connection with human beings at all. It is an organisation system for us to manage. Fine, we maybe need that. But don't make it the front selling thing. There's no sizzle to that, OK? This one is actually from a very famous library in the UK. I won't tell you where. And I could not believe that they still had this kind of sign on the wall telling everybody how the books were arranged. This is a children's <coughs> library. By the time a child has read to the end of this, they're, they're, they'll be five years older. <laughs> um, it's so over-organised, yes? It's not even very consistent. Typical librarians, they can't make their minds up. So everything not only has one name, it has two. Non-fiction or information books. Can we call them either information or non-fiction? I don't mind which, but don't confuse a, pure, a poor child with two, which is what this does. <laughs> um, why are some rectangular and some round? Well, eventually you work it out, but then there's one that doesn't fit. The colours are so close to each other, I can't tell the difference. And when I'm out in the library, what good is that to me? Do I have to keep running back to check? Oh, it's green. <laughs> it must be up. <coughs> no, surely not. And it's not even very sensitive. So all about me, which I thought was quite a nice phrase for children, <laughs> the uh, label for it, this is in a very multicultural area, is white. All about me is white. Now, if you happen not to be white, that's not very friendly. <laughs> so this is the traditional way of doing it, yeah? And what I'm trying to get across to you is there isn't much sizzle. There's an awful lot of sausage, yeah? That's what we're trying to change too. Yes, there's still a label saying children's library, but the image is quite different. And it's not about organisation, it's about adventure, it's about fantasy, it's about imagination. It's about where you could go with a book. Uh, that is a beautiful image, which we've used quite a lot in libraries. It's actually on the wall here in the little school library, and here's the kids in the school library. This is a new school library where the first 57 children in this school had, I think, 37 different languages between them. So, you know, it's a very, very different world that we're living in. Um, that is so much more sizzle than that. Which one is going to make a child pick up a book? Think about it. See it a bit bigger there. You can see the, the way we present the books, just attractive, so people pick them up. OK, the question is, is there an advantage in not having so many books in the shelves? And the answer is, we have to make what I would call manageable choices. So you have to present a smaller choice. If the actual um, shelf looks empty, no, that's not an advantage. And again, we know very clearly from retail that when a display falls below 70% full, the usage drops off. I'll come back to that this afternoon. But that's another critical thing for libraries. Libraries have too many empty shelves, and that's a problem. Um, so it's better to have an area where it's full up and looks tempting, but you have to change the books. Because we want a wide choice, of course we do. But we have to present a series of smaller, manageable choices. That's what I would say. And there's an art to that. <laughs> um, so here's some examples of starting from the reader 
So this is a promotion for children. It doesn't say the name of the author at all. What it's trying to do is to get away from that thing about reading being good for you. Children are told reading is good for them all the time and it makes them not want to do it. So can we associate reading with being a bit naughty? The book made me do it. The dog ate my homework. You know, it's that kind of feeling. Can we make, and the boy is mischievous, gleeful. Can we identify the emotions that you get from reading, which are not just about being goody-goody, perfect. They're actually about exploring quite wicked things. And that's why we all read. And even that's quite, you know, small children. So that's what that one's doing. The one in the middle is aimed at about eight to 10 year olds and is just saying, relax, relax. It's a phrase, just chill, that's used by quite young children in England now. And the one on the right we used uh, to make a creation of selection of books for more sort of 15, 16 year olds. So it's more sophisticated. The phrase is altered image. It's an age where you are thinking about identity and perception and the image, you know, it's very clear that's not for young children. You don't need to do a lot to convey these things. But each of these doesn't name authors, okay? I'll come back to that. But that makes them brilliant for libraries. Because every time you do a display with author names in, what's the problem? You don't have enough copies of those books. So what happens is, famous author, yes, take them. Come in again, famous author, nothing. Can't have those. Join the queue, you might get it in six months if you're lucky. We've got all these other books, we have to persuade them to take something different. So this is a very different approach. It works for libraries very well, I think. It's different from bookstores. There's this big poster, and to show you how we do it in a library, here's a little stand with just six books face forward and six behind them. Okay, it's that small, but the books have been chosen to be just the right thing for this boy that goes with that poster, it connects. This boy might not take from the shelves behind, but as he walks past, there it is, woo, and it looks like it's for me. The image pulls and then the books pull. That's a very different way of making it work. This is one we did, um, in fact, this was the first one in a project that involved libraries from different library services across the UK. And we're looking at the moment for partners uh, to do something similar across European countries. So um, I'm rather hoping there might be some interest in that from today. Uh, but this was a project in England. And the very first thing we tackled with the English, <laughs> and I will say English rather than Welsh and Scottish, if you, any of you have been to England or know English friends, it's a wonderful country, but they do not read or speak other people's languages. And therefore, translation is a very significant thing in English. Well, the lack of it, I should say, is a significant thing in English culture. And the public libraries did not buy very many books in translation. Because partly they don't need to. There are so many books in English. And there are books in English written from around the world, Australia, India, America. But it means that there are lots and lots of other experiences that we don't get. So <clears throat> we looked at how can we promote books in translation? How can we persuade libraries to buy more of them? How can we put them out selling the sizzle so that people take them? And we can show there is a readership for these authors, which there is. <laughs> and you can see we associated it with travel, the sizzle of travel. It says open ticket. Open ticket is something that you can use to go where you want, read your way around the world. So all these Brits who, you know, think they're never going to read a foreign book, they're drinking foreign wine and they're off to foreign hot places. You know, you just need to associate it a little bit with those things and you can check, oh, maybe I've never heard of this author, but I will try. And it was hugely successful. Uh, little, small displays, 50 books at a time, 100 books at a time. Authors who were unknown in England, I think we actually had an effect on sales with that promotion. 
because so many libraries did it and got people taking books in translation. Starting from reader needs is another way to do it. Um, uh, book lists tend to be, again, lists of themes or lists of authors. We make book lists around how reading fits in your life. And we often work from something that uh, somebody has said to us. So this one on the right, when I first started this work, this again became a very famous phrase. I asked somebody, I think it was in a library in Hull, what, what are you looking for? And she, she looked at me and she took a breath and she said, do you know, she said, what I'm really looking for is people, books about people who are more miserable than I am. <laughs> and I just thought that was brilliant. Books about people more miserable than I am. It's a great list. You know, lots of people would read that. And this was done by Oldham Libraries many years later. Uh, and they put with it books to lighten your spirits and they made a whole thing about reading and health. But it's just that when you open it up, it names titles, but the library knew how to substitute others. If they hadn't got those in, they understood the concept and could substitute others. Now, what that could have been, might have been, you know, 10 great world writers. Yes, I see lots of displays like that in libraries, very worthy. 10 great Swedish writers, 10 great Scandinavian writers, 10 great writers from around the world. Oh, you know, what does that do to me emotionally? Makes me feel inadequate, probably, because I don't know some of the names. Makes me feel guilty. Oh, Recognise that one, meant to read it, haven't read it. You know, it's, it's the motivation is not good. Books about people more miserable than you you could probably put in every great writer that's ever written because they're always about miserable people um, and you just don't you know you're connecting it on a human level which is a different way to do it i want to talk a little bit about a, a, an example of this a bigger one to just to give you the thinking this is um, the first promotion done across Wales with all the Welsh libraries. Again, we had a project where we had one librarian from each library service and they met with us for a training day, probably about every three months or so over a three year project. And this was the first uh, thing we devised together. And they decided they wanted to reach uh, young people young adults. They were looking at the sort of 20 to 30s audience. So uh, we had a few people in the group who were the right age. We had others who had adult children of the right age um, and others who just went out and spoke to people. So they did a bit of research. What was going on in people's lives between 20 to 30? And what they discovered was that a lot of people were very busy. They had their first job, a lot of pressure, or they had young family, first child, second child, a lot of pressure, very little children. And others, uh, were very bored. They hadn't got the job they wanted. Maybe they hadn't got a job at all. They hadn't got the relationship they wanted. And they were after something different. They wanted to travel, to, to experience something different. So very different needs within the same age group. And again, we, we looked at how do we create a concept which will work across uh, and appeal. And the concept we came up with was give me a break. Uh, which is how to use reading to take a break from your life, okay? Uh, it's also that American phrase, give me a break, sounds like, you know, be a bit nice to me, be a little generous. It's an, it works well in English. Uh, you'll need to be thinking of the equivalents in Swedish. So here's an example of one of the posters, give me a break from stress. And here's a young person commuting to work or to college and it's all noise round and she's just gone into the world of her book. Give me a break from the kids. At the end of the day, don't bother tidying up, just, you know, uh, enjoy a book. And perhaps my favourite, give me a break from it all. And you're curled up in bed under the duvet with chocolate biscuits and a cuppa and a fantastic book. Now that image, if I just let that work on you for a minute, half the women in this room will be thinking, oh, wouldn't that be nice? Why did I come on this training day today? I could have pretended to be sick. I could have just stayed in bed with my book. <laughs> you know, that's, it's so powerful. That's what we need to tap into.
okay? And I had a website. Uh, this is the website. You can see the look of it is very uh, young. Uh, you can see it live on our uh, archive on our website. It's not live as a website anymore because it's not kept updated. And unless you keep putting new books in, uh, you shouldn't keep things live, I don't think. But you can explore it. But again, I just want you to understand the thinking. Boss getting you down, kids driving you nuts, bored out of your skull. It doesn't have to be like this. Whatever it is that's getting you down, we've got the antidote. Choose what it is you want to break from and find yourself an escape route. And over here, you could have a break from boredom, from everything, you saw that one, from my life, be somebody else in a book or a film, stress, a break from the email, ah, yes, the ironing. You could take a short break, a long break, it's just a short read, long read. If you hit any of them, you got suggestions of books. And there were enough to choose from, but if you didn't like them, there were a few more. And you could connect to the library catalogue, you could reserve them. If you went into the library, there's a little display. And again, if that book wasn't there, the library staff could suggest, oh, this one is also a good book for a break from stress. So you can see it's just a very simple concept, but it's a very different way of arranging the books. So what we're trying always to do is to open up reading choices. Because I've said it's hard to choose. One of the things that happens because it's difficult to choose is people choose the same thing over and over again. We all do it. You know, every time I come through an airport, I think, oh yes, I'm going to read one of those books I've been meaning to read for ages. And then I get to the crime section, which is my soft spot. Oh, I just need something to turn the pages to another crime. Um, and we all have the things which are our easy comfort reading. But then every so often you want something more than that. And how do you risk it? How do you persuade people to try that? We all of us kind of block our reading choices, I think. And anything the library can do to help people open that up is good. So you can bring books together in unusual combinations. If you make a display of crime, okay, might look great. All the people who already love crime might quite enjoy it, but most of them would probably have found a crime book in the library anyway. The people who don't like crime will walk straight past it and they'll never pick anything from it. Okay. Whereas if you make a more mixed display, give me a break, and you include some crime in it, and maybe the crime has a cover that doesn't look quite so traditional. It hasn't got a gun or dripping blood or, you know. Um, uh, you might persuade somebody to pick up a crime book who'd never tried one before. So we can mix things up. We can use surprise and discovery. We also mix increasingly fiction and non-fiction in displays because it's something that the library has very separate. Are you a fiction reader or a non-fiction reader? And actually, you can cross over. There's a lot of non-fiction which is written almost like it's fiction now. Uh, we call it in English narrative non-fiction. Uh, it's the history, uh, biography, business, travel, uh, ideas books that are written in chapters and you're meant to read them uh, as a reading experience, if you like. Um, uh, that's something that we can do really well in libraries and it offers a deeper experience to our readers. Uh, we're often saying be more like bookstores, bookshops, and there are lots of things we can learn from bookstores. But one thing I think we shouldn't learn is always to have mass ranks of the best sellers everywhere. You know, what's the point of the library having the same as the bookstore? The library is richer than the bookstore. It has a wider range, a deeper range. And can we show that better? Here's some examples again. Um, the concept of journeys and we connected it with the kind of, you know, the butterfly flaps its wings and you cause the, uh, the, the hurricane. That could be travel. You could make a display of travel very easily, but it could also be spiritual journeys or it could be life journeys. And you define what the image is saying by the books you put with it. And that actually means you can use an image like that four or five times. 
Some of these um, are going to be available through Eurobib and we will get Swedish onto them. I keep on pushing them, I'm the same in Norway. If you would use these, let me know, because the design work's already done. Eurobib could sell them at quite a low price, but you need the Swedish. That's just easy to understand. Uh, the image says everything. But what might go in it? The non-fiction that could go in that, cookery, chocolate, uh, um, um, uh, aromatherapy, um, lots of things which are indulgent, as well as fiction. Uh, one for men, um, and again, a very different style to it. Um, of course, women can take from it and do. None of these things are hard-edged. They're just suggestions. They just hook people in. One for children. Now, every time I show that in Norway or Sweden, they want a green apple instead. And I say, no, 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 let me have the cake. I need to associate reading with cake for children, not always with healthy food. Uh, this is one we use for, again, mixing fiction and non-fiction. That sense of discovery, of magic for a child is wonderful. And we're just trying to express that. Scary books. <sighs> Another one, uh, you could adapt that kind of idea with whatever the sweets are, you know, mix them up. Yeah. Teenagers, young teenagers, very girly. Okay, I whiz through these. These are just all different ideas for reader-centered promotions. This one, take a bite, <coughs> is again, try it. And we've made the book like the biscuit on the side of the coffee. Relaxing again, ooh, but very different. Take the lead, books to get ahead. There will be people who are aspirational, who want to you know, be on the cutting edge. If you made a little display of those books, what would it look like? And again, it might not be just the very current bestsellers, because so often, you know, the book that was the driving book of thinking, it's a couple of years old and you missed it. <laughs> and I really like it when somebody puts those out again and I can see, oh yes, I always meant to read that. And the last one we've used a lot. Uh, this one was so popular, students asked for a picture of the poster, take a risk on a book. And it's based on the barcode, but instead of just being straight, it's, you know, most of your life you go along, yes, I'm happy to be with the barcode, I'll just get with everybody. Oh, a little kink, I just want something different. Take a risk. This was a poetry, packaged like sweeties. It's short, it's easy, very different message. Okay, let me just check the time, yeah. Because we were going for a a break, yeah, well, you have a break in about 10 minutes, okay? So pace yourselves. <laughs> I will just speak a little bit more. Another thing we try to do is to raise the status of reading as a creative activity. Because it isn't always given a high status. In England, I think we've helped to change this and it is actually a lot better now than it was. But you will still find people saying to their kids, run outside, get your head out of a book. What are you doing, you know, stuck with your head in a book all the time? The image of reading can be quite negative. You know, the writer who's isolated is romantic. <clears throat> the reader who's isolated is just lonely. Yeah. Some people assume that if you read, it's a substitute for life and you have no friends, you have no social life, you clearly have no sex life. And um, I think the success of Fifty Shades of Grey has proven something around that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, all of those things are saying that reading is being used as a substitute. I don't think it is. It's being used as an extension. Reading are, you know, readers are adventurous people, imaginative people. You've only got one life as yourself. You've only got one body. You're only here in one time. When you read, you can be in another time. You can be in a different body, a different sexuality, a different gender. It's fantastic, the experiences that you have. And you're doing it from the inside. We say that uh, reading's the only way you can truly walk in someone else's shoes. Yeah, it's, it's worth thinking about. So <clears throat> one of the ways we try to make reading more 
higher status is to make readers more visible. Again, when you come to promote books, uh, the commercial world certainly, and often uh, libraries too, will have a picture of the author. Yeah, you'll have an author poster, and the author's name and the author's books. Um, and that's fine, um, but can we look not just at pictures of writers, what about pictures of readers? And libraries are really well placed to do this. One of the simplest projects I've ever done many times, and I've got lots of libraries to do this, is just take a camera and on the way out of the library, ask people, would you mind having your picture taken? Some people don't want to do it, that's fine. Many do. And will you hold up a book that you've just borrowed? So we end up with a lot of pictures. Sorry, I'm going to borrow this. We often do it quite formally. So you have the head and shoulders and you hold the book like this. Yeah? And what you establish is a fantastic advert for the library because you will have such a range of faces, different ages, different hairstyles, different clothing. And then you'll have such a range of books. And then sometimes the book and the face don't match. And what you expected this person to be reading or what you expected that book to have as the face is not the same. And that's great, you upset the expectations. And I'm astonished how many people say yes, and lots of them hold the book up. You know, with, this is me, my book. You know, they stand a bit straighter. It's, um, uh, it's a nice thing to do, very, very easy. You have to ask permission, and certainly in our country we can't do it with children, um, uh, because you need parental permission to photograph, so you'd have to set that up specially. Here's an example of a welcome sign for a specific library. It's a small library, and uh, you didn't quite know in the building where the library was. So we made a sign outside, welcome to Dean's Hanger Library. And these are all real library users of this specific library. This lady on the end is their oldest borrower. And she came in specially to have her photograph taken. And, you know, it's a nice thing to do to celebrate um, the, the, the range and type of people. But make it the real people from your library, if they're willing to do it. And that's a fantastic advert. And it says everybody reads. We also use what readers say a lot. Listen to how people speak. Use the words that they speak. Don't make it into something more formal, okay? Keep it concrete, individual. We've often made whole promotions out of a phrase that a, a library customer said. Uh, I told you uh, books about people more miserable than I am. Another one was make room for your life. Sorry, make room in your life for a book. And that one turned into a promotion um, where they had books to read in the kitchen, books to read in the bedroom, books to read on the toilet, books to read in the, bedroom, in the living room, books to read in the children's room, and it was a completely different way of organising the reading that you might do. And the books for the kitchen obviously were cookery and diet books, <laughs> but also uh, novels where food was a big theme. You can mix things up, you know, it's a lot of fun. So listen out for what people say. In other ones we used here, get lost, get a life. And we turn get lost into, you know, this amazing image about getting lost in a book, which is about going somewhere so, so different. I'm just checking. Can you see the colours of these reasonably well? Because that light's a little bit bright. I think it's because of the filming. I hope you can see the colours, because uh, they're rich. Websites. <clears throat> How do you create a website from a reader point of view? This one uh, was already mentioned, I heard in the introduction. It's uh, been going 10 years and it does something that Amazon can't do. And we're working on something new for it. It's coming out in another few months. But the core of it is how to choose a book when you don't know any names of any authors or any titles, you can't remember them. Because what happens with choosing on a catalogue or any other kind of database, or even <coughs> on websites, commercial ones like Amazon, is you always choose something you already know. Because you have to put the name in that you already have in mind. You can't say a book a bit like that one that I had last year, but not quite so violent. You, it, it won't let you do that. Um, this site will. 
So here you open up the sliders, you choose, do you want the book to be funny or serious? Very, very funny, very, very serious, or anywhere between the two. Very, very safe or very, very disturbing. And you can move from one to the other. It allows a huge number of sophisticated combinations and it delivers really interesting reading. It doesn't have the biggest bestsellers in. Every one of the books is read by a team of librarians who meet together to be trained up to do it. And uh, it's a promotional site. It will open up reading choices. But from a reader point of view, the reader is in control. It's a fantastic site. I recommend you to have a look at it. And just as another example, this is one we did a while back too. When Book Brother was at, uh, sorry, Big Brother. Yes, you had Big Brother here? Mm -hmm. Sure you did. When it was at its height, it got younger and younger in the people watching it in England. I don't know whether that happened here. <coughs> so this promotion was actually aimed at about um, 11, 12 year olds, who were the ones who were mostly watching Big Brother by the end. And we called it Book Brother. And they voted the books off. So each book um, has to say, why vote for me? Um, and the uh, webcam here was just on a boy's bedroom. Uh, it didn't move, they thought it was fantastic, it just shook a little bit. Uh, there was nothing to see really. But each week, they voted one off, and at the end of it, you had the winner of Book Brother. So you just use whatever is in the culture at the time. That's probably past its peak now, but at the point where we did it, we did this in Scotland, um, it really, really worked. And the kids just loved it, and they helped to write the text about the books. And again, the text is very different from your normal promotional blurb, because they're having to write to be saved uh, uh, for um, Book Brother. A lot of fun. OK, uh, just a couple more minutes will go. Uh, the last bit that I wanted to talk about was physical spaces. And I mentioned already the people who don't come to the desk or don't talk to you the invisible customer, the one who wants to do it by themselves. And uh, this is one observation um, in one suburban library in the north of England. They actually followed 200 individual people to see what they did in the library. And the average length of visit was nine minutes altogether. So we then looked just at those who stayed nine minutes or less. How many of them took a book? or a film, how many of them borrowed? Here's another interesting exercise to do in your library. What proportion of people go out with something? And what we found was 43% of those who stayed nine minutes or less borrowed a book, which meant that 57%, more than half of them, didn't. Now my question is, what were they doing? Because a lot of them were clearly in for five minutes or less. So they couldn't use a computer. They probably couldn't read a newspaper. They couldn't have a long conversation with staff. They couldn't look up something complicated. They were clearly in and out. So what were they doing? They didn't borrow anything. I think a lot of them came in, had a quick look, didn't see anything they fancied, went out again. The easiest way to increase your performance is to persuade those people to take something. So that's what we set about doing. And this is the kind of change we've made in some of our physical libraries. Our libraries are very squashed. I was uh, thrilled to see the library here yesterday. You're so lucky with the space. This is a very typical English library. And that is the first impression. That's the main door. And what do you get? All this stuff with the trolleys and the work and the ca you know, when you go to a really smart store, are they unpacking the crates in front of you? No. Ooh. Why do we think that's okay in libraries? So we changed it. This is the very same space. And we created a very, very different feel. With, we called it quick choice. Uh, there's a table with face forward paperbacks. And there's a lot of face forward on these shelves here. This is not organised in any order. This section is purely promotional and they can put whatever they want on it at any time. Uh, and it's worked. Um, that is the same space. 
It's a very, very different impression. That looks like a bookshop, but actually all of those books are different. It's not what a bookshop would do at all. It's actually merchandised with library principles, which are very different, I think. This is the same space. Uh, that's where you came in. The counter was out there, um, as it was, and that's how it is now. You can see it's a very, very different experience. The colour's different, the shapes are different. The experience offered is much more tempting. We try and make a journey of discovery to pull people through the space. I may be back to do a bit more on library design, so I'm not doing a lot today. Um, but I did want to share these figures with you. This is a large central library in London. I didn't design this one, but they are using our tables, which we designed in the middle. And I just wanted to give you the statistics. This is a, a library on, I think, six floors. And they created this area they call page one, like page one of the book. And you come into it off the entrance. In page one, the books are organized promotionally. There is no alphabetical order. Um, and it holds, at any one time, about 850 paperbacks. So if you're the sort of person who knows what you want, you never come in here. It would really annoy you. You couldn't find anything. You go straight up the stairs to the main A to Z sequence or the main Dewey nonfiction. Fine, no problem. But if you're the sort of person who doesn't know quite what they're after and who hasn't got that long, maybe only three minutes, you come in here and you grab something. And what's interesting is the impact it's had on the statistics for borrowing. So at any one time, it's holding about less than half a percent of the total library collection. But it's creating 30% of the fiction issues and 20% of the total issues of this library. They sent me the statistics for two years, day in, day out. Pump, 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 pump. Really powerful. So that's meeting that need of the people in a hurry who aren't sure what they want. The books in here change, they're not always the same, but it's a different experience. Now we use that in miniature in every single library that we do. Uh, keep on that one. So uh, if I go back to this one, if you have a very small library, you just have one of these and you keep changing it all the time with what's on it. And more books will go from that table than from anything else. <laughs> 